Well, I think I'm ready. <laughs> All right. Good evening. How's everybody doing? Ooh, I hear myself. I'm on now. It's always awkward because when it's, when it's sometimes when it's set just right, you, you really don't hear a lot of yourself and you don't know if you're on or not. And then you have to figure out, well, do I just act like everything's fine and keep going? But then if it's not, you have to go back and repeat it all anyway. Oh, fun times. All right. Well, we are uh, to our last session and we are going to talk um, about... A really, I, I, I think in my mind, a really practical way of sharing the gospel. Um, but one, honestly, it's also easy to sort of mess up too. Now, remember, I, I, we talked a lot about last week about let's not be, you know, let's not worry about messing up a whole lot. Uh, if we are loving people and we are pointing them to Jesus and we're doing it out of a sincere heart with a sincere understanding of the scriptures, then even if we don't always use the best approach or if even if things don't go the way it's supposed to, uh, we, we ought to have some confidence in the Lord doing the work and not us anyway. Um, but with that being said, uh, we're going to talk about using your testimony to share the gospel. And, uh, and I really like this, this topic, and I'll, I'll tell you a few reasons why as we go. Um, uh, first off, let, let, me, let me talk about the, the, the benefit of using your testimony to share the gospel. Um, your testimony is a story, isn't it? Um, it, it is your, your conversion story, how you came to know Christ, how you came to be saved. And, and the fact is, everybody loves stories. Um, now, you know, I don't know, you know, what you read, if you like to read or whatever the case may be. Uh, but, there, you know, there's a variety of books and they all serve purposes, important purposes. Um, uh, if, if you're a gardener, maybe you've got a book on, on uh, you know, either home remedies or, 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 you know, other sorts of remedies for pests and, 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 and bugs and fungus, fungi, and uh, all, all sorts of things like that. And, and that's probably not the sort of book that, you know, you pull off your shelf and you lay in bed uh, at night right before you go to sleep and think, I'm going to read a, you know, chapter on aphids and how to take care of them. I mean, it's just probably not what you do, but you need that sort of book. Um, you know, other books are, are, are nonfiction telling important stories from history. Sometimes it's anal uh, analysis, looking at why certain things happen. Uh, maybe you enjoy fiction, uh, maybe historical fiction, maybe science fiction, maybe uh, whatever. Um, but the, you know, and all sorts of books, you know, make sense. Uh, they, we heard t uh, two weeks ago uh, from Pastor John uh, something about something antiquated called an encyclopedia. Um, now, that, that's, now, all of that still exists. We just moved where we put it. Um, and so all of those things are useful, but there's something about stories that, that, are, that are important. Um, when you hear a good story, what does it do? It draws you in. You, you want to know how it ends. You, you connect with the people involved. Usually when you hear a story, you begin identifying with, oh, you know, I could see myself doing the same thing, or, oh, I would hate if that happened to me, or, you know, so on and so forth. Or, or you'll, you'll, you'll be listening to it and you say, you know, I know somebody just like the villain in the story I'm hearing. I know somebody like that. Just, I mean, what, whatever it is, we, we connect. And so one of the advantages of using our testimony as a tool to share the gospel is that it is a story. Uh, we use it to connect with people. And the fact is, because it's a story, you can connect with people on different levels. You can connect with people emotionally. You can connect with them spiritually. You, you can um, connect with them in all of these different ways that you can't Look, I'm all for just giving the facts and going. I mean, I do that all the time. That's important, um, too. But, but story is important, narratives. Um, and, and so the benefit of using, the gospel, or using your testimony to share the gospel is that it's a story, and it connects with people, and it draws them in. Um, let me, you know, I, I have been, 
at various times during this series, uh, not not riding the fence, but I'm sure it's sort of showing you how um, things can work two different ways and, and be all right. Sometimes we talked about when we're sharing the gospel, if you're very different, extremely different from the person you're sharing the gospel with, sometimes those differences can be a tool, an asset, a benefit. And then I said, sometimes you've got to take some steps towards a person, not in sin, not in compromise, talk, not talking about anything like that, but just in simple things that you, you take a step towards the person you're, you're sharing with and wanting to connect with so that, so that the similarities can help. It's the same thing in using your testimony, using the story of your conversion and sharing the gospel. There'll be times where you, want to inf- you, might, you might want to emphasize where you're similar to the person that you're talking to, And by doing so, it helps them to relate with you and consequently relate with the gospel. Uh, For for, for example, um, Katie uh, told y'all on week number one, I think, um, uh, you know, about how she was sweet little Katie. And and that was true, still is true. And um, that was, uh, you know, one of the things that that her, her flesh and the devil used to keep her from the gospel because uh, being, um, um, I don't know, complimented, applauded, valued by other people for that, uh, you know, was a defense against the truth of the gospel that we're all sinners and we desperately need a savior. And so, so you know what? She can be talking to someone who's very similar, someone who is maybe religious, so they don't need Jesus. Ever known anybody like that? Somebody who checks all the boxes so they don't have to depend upon a savior. Well, guess what? Katie can emphasize, and I could do much the same because not necessarily that I was sweet John, uh, but just that I like following the rules and I like, you know, I didn't like having my name up on the board at school and and, and any of that stuff. And so uh, Katie and I are sort of similar in that way. And so we can relate to someone and we can use our similarities um, with the person we're talking to, if they're sort of like us, and, and then they can say, and, and well, well, we'll get to the kicker in a second, um, well, in a few minutes, but we use our similarities to create a connection. Um, sometimes that works on the other side uh, quite well, too. Um, one of our uh, great, great friends in Slovenia, it's a man I trained and worked with, and, and he's now taken over our church plant. Um, he's... Uh, He's in his early, well, I guess about mid-40s now. Uh, but he had a rough, rough childhood, rough life. He uh, started drinking um, when he was about 12 or so. Um, drugs was around 14 um, years old. Um, had issues with heroin. Had, had issues where uh, he was rejected by his father. Like his father wouldn't even claim him as, as his kid. Um, you know, a lot of things a lot of water went under some bridges before he came to Christ. And, and one of the things I've seen him do, and I, in fact, sometimes I've even tried to put him in situations where he could because I knew it would be a good fit, where he can be talking with somebody who struggles with some of the same sorts of things that he did. And now all of a sudden he's not coming as, as you know, here is uh, Gordon is his name. Actually, he, he uh, visited Calvary Road. Two year, two and a half years, I don't remember. He's a great big, great big tall guy. Um, he, he can be talking with somebody and, and, and he can share his testimony, his conversion story, how he came to Christ. And now all of a sudden, he, they're not just talking to a preacher who they you know, assume, well, hey, well he's got to be good, he's got to be religious. He, I mean, maybe he's a hypocrite when nobody's looking, but you know, he's at least got to play the part when he's in public and he can you know, tell them, well, hey, you know, I was a drug addict for 10, 15, I, I can't remember now how many years. Uh, and he can share his experience. And now all of a sudden that person can't say, well, this gospel stuff isn't for somebody like me. Uh, and so we use our testimony and we use our similarities because remember, what have we been talking about the whole time? If we're sharing the gospel with somebody, we better be caring about that person genuinely, not as a tool, not as a goal, not to get them saved, but just caring for them because they are a person. Um, And then second of all, we better be talking to them so we can hear their story, so we can hear where they come from. Well, as you do that, then you highlight some similarities. Um, 
sometimes our differences can can create connections as well. Uh, when, when we start to show uh, that, that the gospel is not for one, uh, just one particular group, not one particular age bracket, um, but but the gospel is is for everyone, and so sometimes our our differences and how we treat people. Now we've talked about this many times. I won't rehash it, but but our differences can be key as as well. And but we see that as we're talking to somebody, uh, you know, if they as you're sharing your story and and how you came to Christ, if you find them particularly interested in something that maybe is very very different than they are, but they're really sort of hmm, you know, interested in something, then that might be something you, you, you expand a little bit more and you talk a little bit about because we're sharing our story um, in order to share the gospel. Now, the fact is, though, there is a great danger in using our testimony and sharing the gospel. Now, um, here's the, the surprise. Oh, it's the same thing. Your testimony is a story. Now, why would that be both the pro and the con? Well, here's the deal. Because it's a story, sometimes uh, we will get more caught up in the story part than the gospel part. Now, here, here's what I mean. As we're sharing the gospel with our testimony, there's two things we always, 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 always have to keep in mind. We need to communicate two things. One, we need to tell truthfully what happened um, as you came to Christ. And, 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 you know, and our stories are all vastly different. You know, Katie shared uh, hers. I've shared a bit of mine. Many of you at different times, you've shared your testimony. Um, you know, there are some people that are like Golden that were into everything, you know, eyeball deep in, in outward sin and came to Christ. There's others of us who were very religious and very good, so we wouldn't need Jesus. And that's a type of wickedness all in itself, all on its own. Um, but we want to tell the story truthfully and, and, and not everybody's story is, is, is real simple. I, I heard, uh, one person, um, it was a missionary in, in Slovenia describe people's conversions. There's, there's, uh, two different broad categories. Um, one is a bee sting. Now, uh, we were talking about these things, maybe is in the church office yesterday. Um, and I, did, I didn't share this story, but we, uh, the, the boys were shooting uh, baskets one day um, down here in, in the church parking lot. And Andrew, I don't remember, I don't know what the child was doing. Um, I think he went to get a bottle of water or something. And he came, he, he was running down the, the sidewalk on, on this side. And, and about the corner, the top corner where the parking lot begins, down on the bottom part, um, I saw him, his, his shoulder short, sort of, he jerked. I heard him scream. And the next thing I know, he's taking his shirt off. And I'm thinking, Lord, let him stop at his shirt. We don't want this to go any farther. I uh, don't know what the child is doing. Um, and then we, we figured out as he was uh, screaming uh, for I don't know how many minutes, uh, like in writhing and pain on the, on the pavement, uh, that he got stung by a bee. And, and boy, that thing, I mean, it, it, it stung him. And uh, he felt it. And, and, and a lot of conversions um, are like that. Um, but, but there's another sort of conversion. Now, let me be very clear. Everybody who comes to faith in Christ has to be born again. One moment they're dead in their trespasses and sins, and the next moment they're born again to new life in Christ. Uh, but like I said, how it looks is sometimes different. In some people, it's more like a flower blooming. Now, the fact is, doesn't make it a process. It does not. I am not saying that getting saved in one sense was a process. In another sense, it is. But, it, you know, it's not a dimmer switch. You know, you know a dimmer for, for lights? Uh, if we want to, we could play with the fancy new choir lights back there and dim them and do, do all of those sorts of things. Oh, see? Oh, see? That's what I'm talking about. Um, conversion is not a dimmer switch. Um, it, it's an off and on. Uh, you either are or you aren't, all right? 
But sometimes how we notice it and how, how it takes place is a little bit different. And a flower blooming, the fact is, one moment it is and one moment it isn't. But it's not like it's a little bit sneakier than a bee sting. And I think in some ways, I think Katie's testimony sort of, sort of illustrates that. There, there's a moment when it, when it happened, but, but, but there, there are these things. And so we tell our testimony truthfully because it's a story. So don't make up a testimony that fits with, you know, how it's supposed to be, uh, quote, unquote, better. You, you've got to tell your story truthfully. All right, that's one thing. But the second thing is you've got to share the gospel. And so sometimes here's what will happen. As we're using our testimony to share the gospel, we will get caught up in the, in, in, in the story. Now, look, details are fine. I just told you about Andrew stripping his shirt off or getting stung by a bee. Look, details are fine, usually. Um, you know, that's good. But sometimes we'll get caught up and we will talk about, you know, the color of the carpet. Now, if that works in your story, then you know, more power to you, use it. But we'll talk about the color of the carpet and what that one fellow was wearing and this and that. And we'll tell all of these particulars that don't really, don't really do a whole lot to advance the gospel. And so the, the question is, what is our solution? And, and here's what I would like to say. Use your conversion story your testimony of how you came to Christ as a vehicle for biblical truth. Now you say, well, what do you mean? Well, what I mean is don't say, now look, if this is how you've always done it, I'm not telling you you're wrong. I'm just saying from now on, when you're trying specifically to tell a non-Christian how you came to Christ and you want to share the gospel while you're doing it, don't say just this. I was 12 years old, I came to uh, VBS, and it was on a Thursday night, and after we made the craft, we went to hear the Bible story, I heard the Bible story, and I felt convicted, and I prayed, and I got saved. Now, look, when you're talking to Christians, that's fine. That is, that is fine. But lost people, we need to get the gospel in there. So, um, we did the three circles thing. We talked about that last time. Um, and and, and um, we have, I, I ended up, rather than just, I was going to make one handout that covered all, but I'm going to do more like a little booklet, hopefully by Sunday. Uh, but we'll have it available electronically and also probably can get some paper ones where we get some of the key highlights out of all five sessions. I was just going to pull the, the highlights, but I thought we did it. Y'all sat there a whole lot. Might as well make you get more of it than just that. So uh, I'll make sure you have this. We're going to have the links for the, for the apps that you can put on your phone. Um, you know, there, there's a bunch of different ways. But, you know, we, we did the three circles. Well, what, what if, now just work with me here, what if as you're sharing your testimony, you work in this sort of stuff? All right, so you're, you're 12 years old and you're at VBS. That's good. Tell them about the delicious, I don't know, pizza you had on that Thursday night. That's fine. That's a detail. I mean, you know, it's good. But, but then tell them, you know, that, 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 you know, there's some, th some things going on in your life and maybe your parents have been having problems or problems at school. And you started to realize that the world just didn't seem right. And you didn't understand. I'm making all of this up, but I'm using it as an example. Uh, but, but you started to understand that the world wasn't right, and it started to bother you. You know, you sort of start coming of age, deal. You started, you know, getting a little bit older and realizing, boy, the world seems broken. And, and then you came to the to the the the, the Bible message time of, of of the VBS, and you're 12, so it's like your last VBS before you kicked on, you know, get kicked on up to the youth side of things, and, and you're there during the, the Bible message part, part of the time, and as you heard that, you heard how uh, we're all sinners, and all of a sudden you realize, you know, the problem isn't just the world, but you realize sitting in that church service that, that the Bible says for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the Holy Spirit started working in your heart and started to show you that you are a sinner and that you deserve God's judgment. And, and as you were sitting in that, that seat, you know, in the chapel time or whatever you called it, um, started to bother you and you thought, well, what on earth am I going to do? And then you heard that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, came to fix all of this. And Jesus Christ, God's only begotten son, unique and special son, died on a cross so that you could be rescued. 
And you know what the great thing you found out at VBS? You didn't have to work to earn it. You didn't have to jump through a thousand hoops. You had to repent and believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you learned that you were saved by grace through faith, not of works. See, you can work Bible verses into this stuff too. That's from Ephesians 2 there. Uh, you, you learned all of that and you placed your faith in Jesus Christ as a 12-year-old kid at VBS and God changed you and you were born again and you've never been the same. You've sinned since then. You've messed up. You've had problems. You've had good years and bad years. But God has been faithful with you every step of the way and God promised one day to fix it all and restore everything that's been lost because of sin. And you're looking forward to seeing the Lord do that. Now, now what, what, what did I just I just made up that whole story, except there's a whole lot of biblical truth in there too. And see, what you do is you tell the story and then you start putting those pieces in. Now you say, well, I don't remember what was preached. Okay, well, that's fine. Uh, but I know if you got saved when you got saved, I know that you realized you were a sinner. And I know that you realized Jesus Christ was the only one that could save you. And so, look, don't lie about what you heard, but you just explain the gospel as you're telling your testimony. And now all of a sudden you're connecting with somebody through a personal story, your personal experience, but you're using it as a vehicle to share you know, our three bubbles of God's design, brokenness, and gospel, and it's connected. God's design was ruined by sin. Brokenness uh, is fixed by repenting and believing the gospel. And when we do that, we recover and we pursue God's design. You work those things in as you're sharing your testimony. Now, all of a sudden, biblical truth is a part of your story. It was all along. But, but sometimes we get caught up in telling the story part and we forget the biblical tr truth part. Now, look, like I've said, if you're talking with Christians and we are all on the same page, I don't, you don't have to. Now, if you want to, I'll enjoy it and I'm not going to stop you. But you don't have to explain all of this as you're sharing your testimony to me because we have a shared foundation. But if you're talking to a lost person, as you're sharing your story, work in the, the biblical truth of the gospel. That way, one of the things that does, and I'm going to be quiet here in just a second and let Katie, um, let Katie uh, share what she has tonight. But one of the things that that does is, especially today, now we're not going to have a long talk about what is postmodernism and that is a philosophical theory and thought. And if you really want to discuss that, let me know and, and we can bore each other talking about uh, French French philosophers that are, have, make no sense. Uh, we can do that. We're not going to do that tonight. Um, but but that, those crazy French guys have affected our society a lot. And one of the dangers you have to be aware of today is people will hear your story and they will say, I am so glad to hear that. I'm glad that you found your truth and your way to to happiness or fulfillment or satisfaction or whatever. And one of the things, as we incorporate God's word essentially into our testimony, we universalize it. Because I, don't, I will say I realized I was a sinner, but I'm also going to say I realize that the Bible says that we are all sinners. So when we get to the end of it, they may reject every word I have to say but they are going to be forced to think about themselves in my position too as a lost person needing a savior. And that's a key thing that we have to deal with today that even 50, 60 years ago, it was much less so because of how we thought as a society. But here's what we're not going to do. We're not going to whine and complain about where society's at right now with this. We're just going to accept that that's the way it is. And God's word is no less powerful regardless of the influence of a bunch of crazy French philosophers. God's word's just as powerful. We're just going to adjust our strategy a little bit to take it into consideration. That's all. Now, um, I'm going to read you just a few verses, and then Katie's going to come. I'm, this was your warning, Katie. Um, perfect. I don't think she... Are you any more comfortable on day five? No. Day five is no easier than, than the, the first one. Psalm 137 um, is one of my favorite psalms. I, 
Actually, I have 150 favorite psalms. Uh, I, I really, I really like the psalms. Um, that, that's a Bible joke for any of you. There's 150 psalms in there. Um, I have a sad sense of humor. I realize that I accept it. Um, Psalm 137 really, um, you know what? It's not 137. I wrote down the wrong one. Ah, 136. There we go. Um, Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Oh, give thanks unto the God of gods for his... Nope, that's not it either. Although I really like that one. Here's what I'm going to do. See... I've got, now see, we're not close to done yet. And I don't know how long, Ka- Katie was stalling and she, she was um, deflecting every time I asked her how much time she wanted or needed tonight. So I have no long, uh, idea how, I, I just got no idea. Um, I do have like page two. And so uh, I'm going to listen to what she has to say, but I'm also going to find my psalm. And page two is all about that song. So you're not really getting out of it yet. We're just delaying it. So Katie, come on. people. (laughs) He comes up with a lot of energy and I come up more quiet. Um, I didn't really delay him on purpose. I just, I could not get settled on what to share tonight. And I just kept praying and thinking about it and going through it in my head. And finally today, I just felt the Lord kind of whisper to me and say, just talk about me. So that's what I'm going to do tonight. (laughs) And when I talk about him, I could go on and on and on because there's so much about him. But um, I thought that I would just kind of go backwards a little bit and just as a reminder to all of us that what John has been sharing with you these past couple weeks about the steps to sharing the gospel is so important. But the first thing and the most important thing, and he would agree with this because I know he said it, is making sure that you know the God that you are sharing about. Because if you don't really know him, I mean, even if you have trusted in Christ as your savior, you can't stop there because it's hard to share about somebody that you just don't really know. And so um, that's where I thought I would hit on tonight because that was a big struggle for me for years, for decades, really. Um, I went probably 30 some years of my life not really knowing Jesus. I accepted him as my savior, but... To be honest, I was scared to go deep with him because the stories I had read in the Bible and was taught as a little kid were scary for the people who went deep with God. There was Jonah who got swallowed by a fish (laughs) because he went deep with God. Then there was Daniel who went into the lion's den because he went deep with God. And then there were the three Hebrew children who went into the fiery furnace because they went deep with God. And I was scared. I thought, oh, man, if I decide to, like, really get to know this Jesus who saved me, what's going to happen to me? And what is he going to ask of me? And so I was, I was scared to do that. And then when I went to Slovenia and I got into my prayer closet and he showed me that I was going about it all wrong and that he wanted to go deep with me, then I said yes to him finally. And I faced my fear. And... I've never regretted it to this day. And we have gone through some really hard seasons, and I'm going to share one with you tonight. But through it all, him revealing himself to me has been amazing. And it has changed my perspective of him. It's changed my perspective of my own life. It's changed how we raise our kids. It's just changed me. I feel like a completely different person. And I feel like a spoiled daughter of his because he has revealed so much of himself to me over the past couple years. And what I wanted to share tonight was when you really get to know the Jesus that saved you, you want to talk about him and you want to share all that he's done for you. And so, um, I have a brother, and I want to share a little bit about him tonight, but he passed away a year ago from January at a young age of 45, and I just want to talk about him because I want his legacy to keep living on. I loved him deeply. I think he was an incredible person because I knew him. I knew him, and I want to share him with people, and so 
if you want, if you have that desire to share Jesus with people, you got to know who you're talking about. you got to invest the time into that relationship. And when I said yes to God to do that in my heart, um, he started to reveal himself to me. But it wasn't through easy seasons of life. It was through the hard seasons. And so how I discovered him to be my personal comfort was he allowed my heart to get broken. And then he put my heart back together. And I realized, wow, you are so comforting, like a comfort I've never experienced before. When he showed me that he is our provider, he let us go to a place where we were in great need. We had no idea what we were going to do. And he came through incredibly taking care of us. And I realized, wow, you are so good at providing everything we need above and beyond what we need. When I realized that he was my deliverer and my shield, which is a story I'm going to sh share with you tonight about, was when he literally like came through, like I think he's going to do when he comes and fights for the last time for us. Um, and just totally knocked our enemy out of the way in an incredible way. And I realized then, oh my word, I never have to fear anything again because he's on our side. He's got us. He's got our back. And so through those hard times, even though they were hard, I now have so much confidence in my Jesus. And I want to share that with people. And the story I want to share with you tonight about Slovenia was... Um, when we went up against, really, the devil, um, we faced him a lot on the mission field because he was really trying to stop any work that we were doing. And we had put our boys in national schools because we didn't really have any other option. They didn't let us homeschool, and to send them to an English-speaking school would have cost twelve to $20,000 per kid per year. So that was our only option. And it was a hard journey and every school year we faced new journeys <laughs> of difficulties but this particular year Andrew was in preschool and he had moved up into the next level because he was it was for three and four year olds and when he did that I did not have a good feeling about this teacher and I could not figure out why I didn't have a good feeling but I just didn't have a good feeling about her and so I became very intentional with my children when I moved to Slovenia because there was a language barrier. So it was really hard to have a parent-teacher meeting and try and get a feeling of what's going on when you can't communicate with each other. So I watched my kids very, very intently to see, you know, I had to know what their normal was every day so that I noticed just the slightest change in them because I knew something's going on, I got to get to the bottom of it somehow. Well, Andrew started coming home from school, and he started stuttering. And I thought, that is not normal. He has never stuttered before. And it was immediate. As soon as I pick him up from school, he'd try and tell me something, and it was just he couldn't get it out. He would just stutter. And he, then he started having these bursts of anger. And I thought, something is going on. I told John, there's, something, there's a problem in there because I don't have a good feeling, and we're, showing, we're seeing signs of distress on Andrew. But everything I did to try to find this, what was going on, it was coming up empty. I started going early to pick up Andrew so I could watch the classroom and see the dynamic, which we did not leave him there long. He was there for maybe four hours a day to help him learn the language and give me a chance to learn the language. And everything looked okay in the classroom. I talked to people that knew this teacher to try and see like what their opinion of was her and they would never say anything bad about her. And so then I thought, well, I just prayed. Every time I dropped him off, I pray on the way home, God, be his shield. I know something's going on, but you're not revealing it to me, and I don't know what to do. And so um, when I couldn't seem to get to the bottom of it, I thought, well, then I'm just going to become her friend because i got to get to know who this woman is and why I don't feel good about her. Well, she didn't really want to be my friend, so <laughs> that didn't work out either. So I thought, okay. like I was getting to the point with God where I was like, God, I'm trying to do it your way. I'm trying to walk with you. I trust you. I'm trying to lean into you. I'm begging you to be his shield, but you have got to show me what is going on in this classroom. And so I decided, okay, 
one day I took him to school, and that particular day I felt really bad. I just felt like something was wrong. So I sat in that preschool parking lot, and I prayed. And then I drove home, and I sat in my, my driving way, driveway, and I prayed. And I drove back to that school, <laughs> and I sat in that parking lot again. I prayed, and I prayed till I felt like I had peace, which I never really got. And so I decided, Lord, I'm done. I'm done. I'm tired of guessing of what's going on. I trust you, but today's the day. You've got to show me what's going on. So I didn't go into that school like I wanted to and pull Andrew out. I decided I was going to make, have a parent-teacher conference with her, which I knew was going to be hard because of the language. But I planned on nailing her because I wanted to know, who are you? Why don't I feel good about you? What are you doing in this classroom? What are you teaching my kid? And so... That, that, that was a Friday that we were going to have that meeting. And I decided, I got up that morning, and <laughs> I told God, you are not going to like me by the end of this day because today you're going to tell me what's going on in that classroom. I am not going to stop bugging you until you tell me. And I didn't. I kept begging him, just show me, show me today. I really thought it was going to be at the meeting tonight because I was going to lay into her. Um, and so he picked Andrew up from school, and then I went to run errands, and John called me, and he said, did you see the email from Andrew's school? And I said, no, what is it? And he said, Andrew's teacher just quit today. She's done. She's not even working a two-week notice. She's done. And at first I was like, oh, I wanted to get her tonight. Like, <laughs> I missed my chance. And then I thought, oh, my word, no, like, God, you came through. Like, you didn't just come through. You knocked her out of the way, probably in a loving way. I don't know, but that's not up to me. <laughs> and you just completely delivered my boy out of that situation. And from that moment on, I was like, he is our deliverer. And I am not kidding you. Two weeks later, I went to that school, and my boy was completely different. He had not been eating at school. He was not talking at school. He was not playing with the kids at school. And when I went and picked him up, his, his teacher then said, Andrew is a different boy. I don't know what happened, but he is eating. He's trying to play with the kids. He's trying to learn the language. He's completely different. And I thought, I know what happened. <laughs> God took care of him. Well, God never did reveal to us at that time what was going on in the classroom until about two, two years later. Um, I had become good friends with his new teacher, and we met often to have coffee and to talk, and I was building a relationship with her to share the gospel with her. And um, at this point, Andrew was out of that preschool and into regular school. And she, we met for coffee one day, and she said, Katie, I have to tell you something. And I said, okay. And she said, it's about the preschool. And I was like, oh, no. <laughs> My heart dropped, and I thought, oh, no, Lord, now you're going to tell me what was going on. And she said that there were some really crazy things happening in the preschool, demonic things, honestly. Um, and she showed me videos because she videoed it. She couldn't explain it, cups moving on the table, lights going off when no one was doing it, music coming on when there wasn't, doors shutting and opening, things like this. And I just sat there, and I was like, Yasmina did this happen when Andrew was there? And she said, honestly, Katie, it usually happened in the afternoon when Andrew went home. And I said, oh, my word. And I was like, because I never had a good feeling about his teacher. And she said, oh, you're kidding. Because as soon as I went to our director and told her, the first thing she said to me was, go get all of Hannah's things and get him out of this place. Well, Hannah was Andrew's teacher. And I said, oh, yes, you know, I prayed so hard for God to be Andrew's shield when he went to school. And she said, Katie, Andrew was all of our shield because it wasn't happening when Andrew was here. And I just wanted to cry because I realized, like, God, you are everything you say you are. You are our deliverer. You are our shield. You are our protector. You're our provider and our comforter. Like, you are everything to me. And I just gain so much confidence in knowing all these things that the Bible says about him. And we can read it like I did for years. I can read that he's our refuge and our strength. But when you actually live it and find it out for yourself, it's completely different. And you can share your faith and your testimony with others with full confidence that God can do that for them. And he will do that for them if they put their trust in him. 
And so the reason why those three Hebrew children went into that fire was because they knew their Jesus. And the reason why Daniel went into that lion's den was because he knew his deliverer. And the same reason why I let my boy stay in that daycare when everything inside me told me to pull him out was because I knew Jesus was going to show up. I just didn't know how. And I had to wait for him. I didn't want to shortcut him and miss out on his glory. And so because of that, I have a story to share with Andrew that he can see how God delivered him. And one of my greatest and most sweetest things I hear my children say is, Mom, that was a God thing. <laughs> or when my little Andrew, who does not say a whole lot nice right now, <laughs> when he will say, oh, thank the Lord, and he really means it, I know it is because they are learning to see Jesus in their life. And we all need that. We all need to stop and take a step back and look for him in our day and look for him on our trials because we can get so wrapped up in them. We can get swept away by the pain and the suffering that we're in and we can blame him for it. We can turn it against him and say, why are you doing this to me? When he's actually trying to show you and take you deeper with him and show you that he is your deliverer and your comforter and your strength. And so it's all about how you think and view it. So I guess my question for you tonight is, have you gone deep with Jesus, the one who saved you and gave everything for you? And if you haven't, then what are you waiting for? because you won't regret it. I promise you. I was scared to death for most of my life, and now I just absolutely am in love with him. He is my best friend. He is everything to me. And I drive my older boy nuts because he will say, he will ask me questions. Like one, he'll say, Mom, what's the most important thing in your life? And I'll say, Jesus. And he'll be like, oh, Mom, besides Jesus, what's the most important thing in your life? I'll watch a movie with them, and he likes adventure movies. And so I'm sitting there thinking like, oh, we just went and saw Top Gun. And the whole time I'm sitting there like, that is us. That's us in our spiritual war. Like, oh, God, I'm your wingman, and we're going to go, and we're going to take this on. <laughs> And I come home and Elijah's like, did you like it? And I was like, yeah, I cried. And he's like, why'd you cry? What? I didn't tell him because when I do watch movies with him, at the end, I'll always be like, Elijah, did you see Jesus and this and this and this? And he's like, mom, there was no Jesus in that movie. <laughs> but I know my Jesus and I see him in my life and I see him in many different things because I got to know him and I want to share him with people. So my challenge to you is to get to know the Jesus that saved you. And then it's not a problem sharing him with other people. Thank you, Katie, for that. Um, uh, I'm trying to tease so you don't get an opportunity to tell the other related story. Um, I, I will say this. Uh, so she got one, one teacher fired by praying. Um, she broke another one's arms, both of them, separate occasions by praying too. Um, and and you'll, some, someday, someplace, you'll, you'll need to hear, hear that. And I'm not, I'm not joking either. I'm serious. Both arms. Um, but I, I, I appreciate Katie sharing and... I think the, the fact is, um, you know, and, and the fact that she, she didn't mention this directly, but, um, you know, we were always willing with, with, with both of our boys when we were convinced that they needed to be removed from a situation that we, that we ought to do that. So it, the, the problem in this case is we both, for whatever reason, knew God ne never gave us the liberty to remove him. And maybe it's because we didn't know specifically. I, I don't know what it was. Later on, just for other reasons, educational and, and other reasons, we did our last few months in Slovenia. We pulled him out of his school, which was a good school. He had a good teacher, but it wasn't working for him at that point. And uh, we, we paid a small fortune for like two months of, <laughs> of, of, of school. And so it, it was strange how the, 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 
for whatever reason, the Lord didn't give us the liberty to do so. But uh, now, I guess in hindsight, as, as Katie said, we see God working in, in all of that. Um, Psalm 107. Uh, let's see. Th- 30, 30 off will make a difference. Um, it, it is, is where I'm... So Katie, Katie gave you her closing um, devotional thought. I'm going to do the same... As what well, different thought, same Jesus, same book. Um, but I want you to see just a few things in Psalm 107. Uh, it's only 43 verses long. I've got 15 minutes. Let's see what we can do. Um, it says, Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he hath redeemed from the hand of of the enemy. So real quick, where's my whole deal about using uh, our testimony to share the gospel? Psalm 107, all of it start to finish. Uh, and I'm going to give you just a few examples from it relating to what I started this session with and then close with the devotional thought. But the fact is, uh, the scriptures tell us if, if Katie lived that experience, if I lived that experience, if Andrew lived that experience, I'm sort of glad. I, I never saw the video of the cups moving. Um, I trust Katie. Don't think she'd lie to me. Um, I didn't see that. But there's that's some crazy stuff. That's just not normal. That's just not normal. Um, now, you have to understand this is a country, uh, the crime rate is minuscule descri- uh, compared to the United States. The, the murder rate in the United States is seven times higher, not, not 7%, not 70%, seven times higher in the U.S. compared to Slovenia. Um, it is a beautiful country. Uh, people are polite all of these things, but there is a there is a spiritual darkness that goes back hundreds of years. Up until World War One, they still had paganism, paganism which had been exterminated from most of Europe uh, hundreds centuries centuries before. Paganism had held on in some of the deep hollers and valleys of Slovenia. Yes, they have hollers in Slovenia, super steep valleys. Um, it had hung on where they had essentially witch doctors that had hung on until World War I. Um, and it was a, a dark, dark, dark spiritual place. And the scriptures say if you're going to live through something like that and if Jesus is going to take care of you, then you've got one big obligation on the back side of this thing. And that is to tell people how good he is. And that's where the psalmist begins. He says, let the redeemed, those who have been redeemed out of the hand of the enemy, let them say so. And he gathered them out of the lands from the east and from the west and from the north and from the south. They wandered in the wilderness in a solitary way. They found no city to dwell in. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted in them. You know what he's doing right there? You know what, if I was smart, hold on. Hold on just a second. Wait for it. You know what he's doing, don't you? He he, he is laying out the brokenness that was in the world for these fellas. And he is putting scriptural truth inside the testimony, talking about the brokenness, that that God's design had been ruined. They're wandering around. They don't have any home. They don't have any place to go. And he's building tension in the telling of a story. And then, and, and look what, it, what he covered. Verse 2, he said, uh, is people that were, that were in the hand of the enemy, uh, that were wandering around and lost, the desperate and the dying, he's building tension. And then what's he do? He jumps then to the gospel and he says in verse number 6, Then... They cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them out of their distresses. It it reminds me of a great deal of Ephesians 2, um, where you see these turns, these these things where it's it's storytelling. It's telling a progression so that you're you're brought into what's going on. Ephesians 2 says, um, 
And you had the quick and made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. Where in time past you walked according to the, the course, the pathway of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our, our, our conversation, our lifestyle in times past, and the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. Who And were by nature, we were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. And then, do you know the next word? It's not then, so if you're trying to copy from Psalm 107, that's not it. Uh, but it's the word but. But God, who is rich in mercy, has quickened us. He's made us to alive together. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in our sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. So you get tension building. And then you get the climax of the story. They called out in distress. And God rescued them. And then you get resolution. Verse number 7. Well, verse... Six, he delivered them out of their distresses. It didn't stop there, though. And he led them forth by the right way that they might go to a city of habitation. Oh, well, no, I'm not going to say that part yet. Hold on. He, he gives the resolution. He didn't just rescue them. He set things right and got things going back towards God's design. What? Before it said they wandered around. They didn't have any city. They didn't have any home. They were desperate and solitary Wandering and lost. And then they cried out. God rescued them, gave them a home, gave them a city. Hey, getting them back to recovering and pursuing God's design. He's using their story to communicate but biblical truth. He's doing exactly what I said. See, it wasn't original to me. I just stole it from the psalmist. It's the idea of using that. And then there's a response. Now, in every situation, is different. When you're sharing the gospel with somebody, your, your desire is that, that they would want the peace and joy that you have found in Christ. And so when you're sharing this with a lost person, that's where you'd want to see things end up. Um, but when you're sharing with a Christian, that's a little bit different because you're not trying to get me saved again. Um, but what I ought to do is come alongside of you and rejoice with you and verse number 8 says, Oh, that men would praise the Lord for His goodness and for the wonderful works to the children of men. For He satisfies the longing soul and fills the hungry soul with goodness. All right, I'm going to do one more. I just want to show you this pattern. Such as sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, being bound in affliction and iron. Because they rebelled against the words of God and, and contempted, they were, they were against the counsel of the Most High. Therefore, he brought down their heart with labor. They fell down and there was none to help. You know what he did in the second? It's like the uh, second verse of the same song. His people in this case, who was it? In this case, it was the longing and hungry, the sinful that are under God's rightful judgment. And then what do they do? They come to their senses. And he says, Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them out of their distresses. He brought them out of darkness, and he broke their chains. And then we get to the, to the, uh, the chorus again. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness. And for his wonderful works to the children of men. When we're sharing the gospel with a lost person, our desire would be their response. Would be that they'd come to faith in Christ. Now, it may not happen today. It may not happen tomorrow. It might happen ten years down the road. And you may never find out till heaven. And you know what? That's okay. That's, that's God's business, not our business. It's between them and him. But that's our response. But we're, we're sharing our testimonies with one another. We ought to rejoice with one another in that God is good. And his mercy endures forever. I'm just going to point out just a few more things in, the, in this psalm. Um, he brought them out of darkness. Uh, look at the ones he's got. He, he's got the, the lonely and the solitary, the wandering and the first stanza. 
the second stanza is he got uh, the, the ones that are uh, wrathful uh, or under God's wrath because of their sin. Um, verses 16 through 18, it's the foolish that are reaping the consequences of their decisions. And then they cried out too and God rescued them. Um, in verses 22 through 27, it's the affluent uh, business person who's, who's trusted their, their, their riches. And there's nothing wrong with riches. But these were trusting that more than God. And, and God put them in a place where he was all they had. And you know what they did? They cried out into the Lord too. And guess what? He rescued them. And so you, you go through the psalm and over and over again you have people coming to a place of crisis where there was no help but Christ. And Christ was that help. And then they praise Him for His goodness. And I think the thing that I come away and... and and then there's this whole last part of the psalm where the psalmist just sort of gives up on his form and, and says, you know what? Uh, we're just going to talk about how good the Lord is. And then that's how he finishes out the psalm. But I, I think the thing I take away from this psalm is that the testimony is a powerful thing. And your testimony, doesn't matter how flashy it is, doesn't matter how, you know, whether you're ashamed of things from your past or you think it was kind of boring and, you know, you're just like eight years old, saved a VBS. And, and you think, in, in either case, you've got to come to terms with your testimony is less about you than it is about Jesus. Because whether you were a seven-year-old who had not sold drugs on the streets of the south side of Chicago or whether or not God saved you out of a prison at 37 or 77, wherever it is, the fact is it's Him that's doing the saving. It's Him that's rescuing. It's Him that we call out to in our distress, and it's Him who rescues us. And the fact is, as I look at this psalm, I don't see one class of people who would have been excluded. I don't see any type of person um, young or old, rich or poor, bad, good, what, and there, there are none good, the psalmist says. I see that it's available. And so I, I hope this changes. I, I hope you take to heart what Katie says, uh, said. I mean, I assume she'd keep saying it. She gets the opportunity. And that is no Jesus. And then the thing I would book in that with is then as you as you share Jesus with people, realize that He is powerful enough no matter where we're at. You, look, don't you ever get into a situation you think, well, I don't know if Jesus can work in this one. I don't know if He can save a person like this. And you know, there could be a bunch of different reasons. You might be looking at that person, they're so wicked, and you think, well, I don't, I don't know. Well, yeah, He can. He saved you, didn't He? And you say, well, I didn't do it. I don't care what you did or did not do. If the scriptures are true, we were a long ways from him. And we needed him. And he's the one who came looking for us. And he'll work for that other person too. And you say, well, well, well this person isn't so bad. They're just so, they think so different. They're so uh, maybe liberal. Uh, they're an atheist. They're an agnostic. My question for you is, are the scriptures true? Is the word of God the living word of God? Is the Holy Spirit working in the hearts of men and women using the word of God? Yeah, it is. And so the fact is, if you share the truth, I, I'm not telling you whether or not they'll accept it. But what I'm saying is, God can work in any heart, anywhere, and we don't know. All we ought to be is sort of like what Katie, uh, I feel like she was talking about. If we're in love with him and then we're available. That will make a whole, whole lot of difference in a whole lot of people. You know, I was thinking about, do, do we know what sort of... Uh, either to both of the head honchos in the back. What, what, what sort of, if we were to put a number on how many people regularly attend Calvary Road, what would, what would we say? 
500? Can we bump it up to make the math easy to 600 today? All right. We're going to do 600. There you go. Um, you, you know how many people live in Haywood County? I realize we have people come from, from outside of Haywood County uh, to come to church. You're welcome. I'm uh, glad you're here. Um, uh, but likewise, there are people from Haywood County that go elsewhere outside of Haywood County Church. So I, I'm going to say it averages that. You know how many people live in Haywood County? About 60,000. I know we grow when, when, when uh, you know, our, our, um, our, our friends from elsewhere come for the summer and then, then leave during the winter. Uh, but, you know, like the official numbers, you know, around 60,000 or so. We'll round to make our math easy. Um, that means 1% of Haywood County comes to Calvary Road. Now, in one hand, that's, a, that's, that's sort of small potatoes, okay, in one way of looking at it. Um, that's, that's probably not a bad thing. Um, but on the other hand, do you realize the impact that we ought have on Haywood County? That means when you're in Walmart, there's a hundred people there statistically on average. You know, there's, there's one person in Walmart at all times. If there's a hundred people in there, that comes to Calvary Road. Now, what that means is what are we doing with our, our testimony and the influence that we have with the people who live in this county? The very beginning, I'm wrapping this up. The very beginning, one of the things we said is to, to, to share the gospel, you have to die to yourself. That doesn't mean you're a doormat. That doesn't mean you let... People walk all over you. It's not that at all. Uh, but what it does mean is your priorities become God becomes God's priorities, and you start living for Him rather than yourself. And the fact is, if just a fraction of us were to end up there in that place of being surrendered to the Lord and wanting His will over our will. With how many of us there are, we ought to make a difference in somebody's life, hadn't we? There's too many of us in too many places. And there's people that you know and you know and you know that I'll never meet. But you with your testimony can love and share the gospel with people who desperately need Jesus. The question is, are we going to fall in love with Jesus and are we going to care about them? And that's where we're going to wrap this up. Now, there'll be things that we'll do, you know, uh, even Pastor Mark and I were talking, I don't know, maybe a week or two ago about things that we can do to follow up with this. Uh, you know, maybe even some hands-on training where we're not in a large group. Maybe even do something where those of you would like to ask questions or practice some of this in a small setting, we can do some. I mean, we've got options of things that we can do. But we've come to the end of it. I thank you for your attention and being nice to us and letting us talk to you so long. And I thank Katie for doing what I know she did not want to do. Uh, I think she's still holding a grudge against Pastor Seth. And she says no, but we'll see. Um, but I, I appreciate and I hope we've been a blessing to you and a help. Uh, but let us continually be that resource um, if you end up in a situation with somebody uh, and you don't know how to go about it or they ask a question, you know, you don't know how to answer, um, come talk to me. We'll find the right resource. We'll find the right book. We'll find the right, you know, answer. We will pray together. Uh, we, we are a team in doing this. Um, and let's act like that and do that going forward. Uh, let's close in a word of prayer. And you have come to the end of it, five long weeks of sharing the gospel. Father, I thank you for today. And Lord, I thank you for your goodness. Lord, I thank you for the uh, people that you've had here each night who have had a desire um, to point people to Christ. I pray that you would help us to love you more than anything else, anyone else, that we would fall in love with you afresh and anew. Lord, I pray that you would give us compassion for people who are lost and hurting, people who are easy to love and people that are hard to love, and you would give us, um, give us a heart for them. And then, Father, I pray that you would let the redeemed of the Lord say so, that we would 
open our mouths, expose ourselves sometimes to rejection, uh, but that we would point people to Christ. I pray that you would empower this church, that you would work in this place, and that you would work in Haywood County. Lord, there's a bunch of people up and down these roads who are desperate, some who admit it and some who are running 90 miles an hour to avoid admitting it. But they all need you. Lord, I don't know what's going to happen with the economy, with gas prices, housing prices, jobs. I don't have the faintest clue. And Lord, I know anybody who says they do know, they don't really know. All of this thing, these things can all change on a whim, on a, a moment's notice. But I do know that you're good and that your mercy endures forever. And Father, I know that you can work in hearts. And I pray that you'd work in Haywood County. And Lord, I pray that you would begin working in people's lives that need to be saved. And Father, I pray that we would see people come to Christ in this church and through this church in and out of this church, but through the people of Calvary Road Baptist Church in the days to come. We desperately need you. More than we need $2 a gallon gas, or more than we need all of our comforts. And we thank you for those things. But we need you. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thanks for joining us today in worship here at Calvary Road. It is our true joy and honor to be able to bring these worship services to you. And we are so thankful for you and all of you that watch us and pray for us. You know, you might have been watching this service today and you realize that you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus. We would love to assist you in that. Would you reach out to us at the information that you see on your screen? You also might have a prayer request or something that we can help you with, and we would love to do that. You too can reach out to us with that information. Again, we thank you, we love you, and we greatly appreciate you.